Well, last week we covered chapter 25 and it showed uh, some furniture. And we tried to get the spiritual meaning out of the furniture and how it was built and all that. It was very detailed about the ornamental uh, carvings and the things on the lampstand and what it all meant and everything. But I wanted to go on a little faster, so I skipped a lot of reading about that. And this week we're going to go on just to building the tabernacle itself. We haven't finished the furniture, that'll be next week. There, we've got a couple more pieces of furniture to build. And we need to see the spiritual meaning in each one of these. So I'm probably going to be skipping around and not going verse by verse, but just uh, important verses. So we may go a little faster. Okay, in chapter 25, we looked at the building some of the furniture that was found in the tabernacle and the spiritual meaning that could be found in their construction. This week we will continue with a look at the construction of the structure of the tabernacle and the spiritual meaning continues to paint a picture of the coming of Jesus as the Savior of mankind given to us by the Creator of the universe. Some of the reading gets tedious, so we'll look at key verses and skip others to try to move quicker. It's recommended that we read each verse at home to see what the Holy Spirit reveals to you about what is said. Now if y'all read it verse by verse at home, that's fine because I believe the Holy Spirit will reveal things to you that I didn't see or mention at the time. Because each color, each number, where it's placed, everything means something. Everything is a spiritual meaning to it. And it's, it's copied in the temple and it's copied in us. So each, each number and each color and everything means something. Okay, verse 1. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen and blue, purple, and scarlet thread with artistic designs and cherubim you shall weave them. So here he's going to make ten curtains of fine wo uh, woven linen, blue, purple, and scarlet. Blue, purple, and scarlet are royal, divine colors. Okay, Ten is completion. A lot of people say, well, seven is completion. No, seven is holy. Okay, Ten, one hundred, one thousand, ten thousand, all means completed. That's everything. It's complete. Okay, Linen is righteousness. White linen is always righteousness. And they're going to put blue, purple, and scarlet thread with artistic designs of cherubim you shall weave them. The cherubim become a big part of this. Even though nobody has really seen one except for Moses and the ones that have been taken into the, the temple of God in the spirit, they have seen cherubim. We don't really know what they are, but they're bigger than angels. So these are like uh, other celestial beings that were made by God to guard His throne. So they are actually in charge of everything in the throne room. <clears throat> this is where we're building, is the throne room of God where He lives. So He wants pictures of cherubim on the wall. Now a person that's never seen a cherubim, they wouldn't know how to sew it. So in chapter 30 we read that the Holy Spirit was given to the artisans that were going to make this. So they were, they're going to be able to visualize what God wants woven into this fabric. Verse 2, the length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits and the width of each curtain 4 cubits and every one of the curtains shall have the same measurements. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another and other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. Then he goes on talking about putting loops of, of uh, fabric in there. He makes loops and then they're going to make golden clamps to clamp them together. All of this is where they're going to build it. Now this is going to be on the inside of the temple. So they're going to lay it over the roof and clamp them all together and they're uh, uh, 42 foot by 6 foot. So they're 6 foot wide, 42 feet long and there's going to be 10 of them. So they, they lay them over the tabernacle and the gold is going to be on the inside and the cherubim are going to be showing on the inside. The fine woven linen is going to be showing on the inside and this is the first layer that goes over it. If y'all remember last week, I, I described this, it's going to look like a pile of stuff out in the desert. So it's not going to be anything good looking to look at, but this, the beautiful part is on the inside. And all the gold and silver is on the inside. So the bronze speaks of judgment, and that's on the outside. So that's things that you can't see from the inside. So it's very important to know the in from the out. Okay. The lapire was made out of bronze, wasn't it? 
The what? The live wire or what they wash? Yeah, out, that's outside the building. So inside the holy, holy ground is going to be all gold. Inside the Holy of Holies is all gold. Okay? So anything inside the curtain is going to be gold. Everything outside is brass or brazen, uh, bronze. <clears throat> and another thing I wanted you to see is these uh, measurements. This thing is uh, 45 feet across and uh, uh, 45 feet long and like 30 feet across, I think. I'd have to get my measurements and find out. But these panels are going to be enough to overlap it. So if you think of shingles, you're going to see that the longer ones are going to be in, on the top and the shorter ones are going to be underneath. So it's going to act like layers and the water and the dirt, dirt and dust can't get in because it's going to overlap. Okay? Now remember 10. The next one's going to be 11. We're going to go over that. What we see described here is a series of curtains that are woven in pieces that will be clasped together later by golden clasps. Each curtain was 42 foot by 6 foot and there will be 10 of those made. These pieces will make up the body of the tabernacle and each panel has cherubim embroidered in them, blue, purple, and scarlet, all denote royalty as for a king. Verse 7, you shall make curtains of goat's hair. This is the next layer we're talking about. Uh, to, to be a tent over the tabernacle, you shall make 11 curtains. Okay? So, goat's hair denotes sin. Everywhere in the Bible you see goats, it's going to be for a sin offering. Okay? The length of each curtain shall be 30 cubits, with the width of each curtain 4 cubits, that's 6 foot again, and the 11 curtains shall all have the same measurements. And you shall couple five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves. And you shall double over the sixth curtain at the forefront of the tent. So goat's hair is basically what all of the tents were made out of back then. So this is a normal thing, but he wants 11 and he wants a double over the front. So there's going to be a flap over the front. And 11 is the number they chose. Okay. Uh, and you shall couple five curtains by themselves. Uh, six curtains by themselves and shall double over the sixth curtain in the forefront of the tent. Then on top of these linen panels, curtains of goat's hair were made to put on top of the linen panels. They were 45 feet by 6 feet, so they're a little longer. To overlap the linen sheets over the top of the tent. Goat hair speaks of sin. All through the Bible, a sin offering was made with goats. Goats were constantly associated with sin. Jacob tricked Isaac by applying goat skin to his arms and neck to fool his father for his birthright. On the other hand, Jacob gets fooled by his 11 sons that Joseph was dead by soaking his coat with goat's blood. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. In Matthew 25, Jesus himself calls the sheep his and the goats are not his. In the Feast of the Atonement, two goats are displayed at the temple and one is chosen to die, and the other becomes the scapegoat to take the sins away from Israel. Now what you're going to find is there's lots of sin offerings. If you go through Leviticus and Numbers, they're going to tell you all these exotic things. It's even something, if, you're, uh, if you've been fooled, and you shouldn't have been fooled, it's a sin and you have to sacrifice a goat. There's so many goat offerings in the Bible. How many do you think there was? 11. 11. So all of the goat offerings that you read about in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and all this, add them up and there's 11 sin offerings for goats. There are several sin offerings made with goats for the months of the years. They, they have to uh, offer a goat every month just for a sin for the month. To cleansing the priest of sin. When the priest had to start their cleansing, they had to sacrifice a goat. The sin of ignorance. That's what I was talking about before. Uh, all made with goat sacrifices. Guess how many sin offerings are listed in scriptures using goats? Eleven are listed in scriptures and there will be eleven panels of goat skins over the tabernacle. Notice also that the linen panels were clasped with gold clasps 
and these goat hair panels will be clasped with bronze clasps. The goat will be on the inside, but the goat hair will be on the outside of the tabernacle with bronze clasps. So just imagine the linen is on the top, and then on top of that is goat. Then, we have, then we're going to have lamb, and then we're going to have what I think is going to be either seal or porpoise skins, but we'll talk about that when we get there. It, your Bible probably says badger skin, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Okay, now, I'm skipping to verse 14 because we're through with the goat's hair panels, and then he says one sentence. You shall also make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent and a covering of badger skins above that. And that's all he says. No dimensions, no, no numbers of panels, no nothing. But So you have to look at what is he trying to tell you. I want lamb skins dyed red on top of the goat skins. So the lamb's blood is going to cover, 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 the, cover, the, cover the goat skins. And then a covering of badger skins above that. One verse comes next with hardly any explanation given on how to make it. In my opinion, that is just saying that the reader should just look at the symbolic meaning of ram and red. Ram's blood covers the sin of men since Genesis and Adam and Eve. When, when they had the fig leaves, God went and killed an animal. Doesn't say what. We, we're not told what. But we know that it was a lamb skin that covered their sins. Okay, we're going to find out later that Cain and Abel made a sacrifice and Cain's was not accepted because Abel's was a lamb and he sacrificed something made, he made with his own hands Okay, <clears throat> wasn't there stuff in the garden vegetables or something like that well, no it was grain it was a grain offering oh. but it was just he went over to his grain pile and, and got a bunch of it in a bag and went and offered it to God and God says you know this is a blood offering this is not the offering I'm looking for now so uh, Abel was able to satisfy God because he sacrificed a lamb and Cain it was like if you'll just go kill a lamb which he would have had to buy because he was a farmer and see uh, Abel was a sheep herder so why didn't he go to his brother and say I'll give you five dollars for a lamb and I'll sacrifice him. He said, well, sin lies at the door because you were trying to beat your way out of the sacrifice. The sacrificial system was set up so that we would understand when Jesus comes, what his purpose was. Okay, in Genesis 3, a lamb is inferred to be killed to replace the fig leaves that man tried to cover their own sin with. If God is consistent, the animal that was used for the skin covering had to be lamb skins. It was the failure of sacrificing a lamb that got Cain in trouble. It becomes more obvious at Abraham's offering of Isaac when a substitutionary ram was caught in the thicket to be sacrificed. So when Abraham is about to sacrifice his own son, God stops him and there is a ram trapped in the thicket and the thorns, remember we talked about acacia wood, is thorns, so the ram was caught in the thorn bush, and that was to be the substitutionary sacrifice for Isaac. Okay, So he is showing all this way back before Leviticus and the priesthood and all of this, that ram's, ram's blood was going to take away the sin of the world. Okay, And finally we see the strange covering of badger skin. That is probably a mistranslation of Hebrew word not found anywhere else in scripture except speaking of the shoes used in the wilderness you're going to see several times even up into the new testament that they're going to be talking about the shoes never wore out the shoes never wore out the shoes never wore out you're going to see it many many times and he is saying that, the, that god provided a skin that was so tough that it would wouldn't wear out so this word that they infer this badgers is not it's not a word that's used very often, only in the skin of the tabernacle and of the shoe cover. Now this is this is the Septuagint. If y'all remember me talking about that, this is the Bible that they had uh, translated from Hebrew to Greek at the time of Jesus. And it says here, And thou shalt make for a covering of the tabernacle ram skins dyed red and blue skins as covering above. 
And you can go through here and you'll find several different things. Blue skin, uh, porpoise skin, uh, seal skin. Uh, I don't think I have it in here. There's one that's a Jewish Bible. Let's see. Maybe this one. Uh, verse 14. I should have checked it. Seal skins. See? Right there. So there is a controversy over what this word means. I choose to believe it's porpoise skins or seal skins. Because it's waterproof and it lasts for years. We make boots out of, you know, shark skin boots and things like that. A, a lamb skin or a badger skin or a mammal skin probably wouldn't hold up for 40 years. In fact, it held up for 400 years after the 40 years when they got in the promised land. <clears throat> so this was something that would make it watertight and dirt proof over the top because it was the last skin on the top. Plus, it had to be kind of ugly. If you'll think of a seal skin, it's kind of motley, spotted, whatever. And the whole point is that when you're looking at this building that they spent eight tons of gold in, it looks like a pile of trash out in the middle of the desert. And I wanted to point out that Jesus was nothing to look at. There was nothing comely about Him. All the gold is on the inside of Jesus. Okay, I choose to use the porpoise or dolphin explanation just from the color and the toughness of the skin. In the Septuagint, the word is translated as blue skins. One Jewish version uses seal skins. Whatever word you choose to use, I believe it speaks of God's providing <coughs> fine leather for you throughout your walk in the wilderness with Him while covering us with His protection. So we need to look at our life as a walk with Jesus through the wilderness and he is going to cover us with something so tough that it won't wear out and he is providing it for us okay so recapping the covering coverings of the tabernacle first the linen speaking of God's righteousness goat hair speaks of the sin offering and the ram skins dyed red speaks of the substitutionary death of Jesus for all sin and the final covering is for God's provision in our walk with Him. Everything in this tabernacle speaks of Jesus and God and heaven. And everything represents something. And if Jesus is the tabernacle of God, you remember He said that He was the Godhead fully. And He says, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. Because God was in Him. So if God is in the tabernacle... He's in Jesus. And if God is in the tabernacle, He's in us. A Jew would never figure this out because everything was holy, separated. He could not, you could not get close to Him. And we say that He lives in us. So they look at us like, you know, that's the strangest thing I've ever heard. Because their whole life has been holiness right. and burning up and separation from God. But when Jesus died, the veil tore in half. And that all went away. Verse 15. You are to make a framework of boards for the tabernacle from acacia wood standing upright. So now we know there has to be walls, uh, at least four walls in there, to uh, stand upright to hold all these skins up and build a structure. So they want it to all be gold. So they build acacia wood, which talks about humanity, covered in gold. So wood burns up. Wood, hay, and stubble burns up. So it has to be covered in gold. The gold comes from God. Okay, So this is all covered in gold. <clears throat> the length of each board is to be 10 cubits by 1.5 cubits wide. This is 15 foot tall and 27 inch wide board. So I don't know of too many trees that are 27 inches you could cut a board out of. So they probably had to piece together some tongue and groove boards there and cover them in gold. Okay. There are, two, are to be two supports on each board joined uh, one to another. Do this for all the boards of the tabernacle. So there's describing a tongue and groove situation to put them together. And plus you also have to remember that they have to take down this and move it and then put it back up. Take it down, move it, and put it back up. So it was built like a puzzle. And everybody knew what piece went where. Because they, they may have even numbered them. We don't even know. Okay. Yeah, everybody was assigned. Like, 
I could have the job of carrying this one board. Think about a 15 foot board covered in gold. That's a two or three man job. That's a two or three man job. But I would be assigned to carry this one board the whole way, all the time. That's your responsibility. That's my responsibility. And see, the reason they made these panels was they would take them and make them six foot wide and 42 foot long. They roll them up into a roll of carpet and carry them. And that's how they moved. And they would say, this is panel one, this is panel two. Every time that they would rebuild the tabernacle, it would be exactly like it was before. <clears throat> there are to be two supports in each board joined one to another. Do this for all the boards of the tabernacle. Now the way I've got this pictured, they've got a hundred pound block of silver and one tongue and groove that fits into the block of silver. And each board is going to have two blocks of silver. So the blocks of silver are going to be 100 pound blocks of silver and each board takes two blocks. There's going to be a groove in it that the board fits in so that it doesn't touch the ground. Okay. You are to make 20 of the boards for the south side of the tabernacle. So there's going to be 20 in the south, 20 in the north. <clears throat> and 40 silver bases underneath the 20 boards. So that he's telling you 2 to 1. Two bases go underneath one board for its supports and two bases under another board for its support. Now if you remember we talked about silver being... <coughs> Redemption and blood. Anytime you read about silver in the Bible, you need to think about redemption and blood. Every time. A silver coin means somebody is redeemed with blood. Okay. Now we move on to the boards. Each board was 15 foot long and 27 inches wide, all covered in gold. There would be 20 boards on, each, on a side, and each board would be mounted in two blocks of silver weighing 100 pounds each. Each board would have two tenons that fit into two of the silver blocks touching the ground. The frame would not touch the ground in any place. The whole structure was sitting on top of silver representing the blood of the redemption. So, I don't know if y'all can imagine a building this size with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of silver yeah. and nothing touching the ground. It was not allowed to touch the ground. So what keeps us off the ground is His redemption, His blood. Everything is covered in His blood. Everything stands on His blood. We're standing on the blood of Jesus. The building stands on the blood of Jesus. Okay. Uh, each board was made in a tongue and groove type construction for ease of construction and deconstruction to be mobile. But it was strong to stand up to the wind and weather found in the wilderness. It would have been airtight to keep the dirt and water out. The overlapping coverings of the roof would have weighed tons but looked as though just a pile of skins and not very pretty. All of the beauty would have been inside. So if you can imagine how strong this has to be to put this tons of, of material on top of it. It was heavy. This was a heavy duty building and nothing was going to knock it down. Meaning the provision of God will keep you up. Okay. We might look at the silver sockets as the redemption blood, but in Exodus 30 we might see something else significant called the census tax. Now, I thought this was interesting. Uh, we'll go here to Exodus 30. And uh, you see the census tax here. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, When you go to the census of the children of Israel for the number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord. When you number them, that there may be no plague among them when you number them. Now this sounds so weird, but if anybody, if Moses wanted to count the people, they all had to pay a tax. They went to the temple to keep the temple up. Okay? And if you didn't, I mean, you might catch a plague. Okay? Does anybody think of a story in the Bible where the number of the people were counted and 70,000 of them died of the plague? David listened to Satan and numbered his people without God's permission and 70,000 died overnight because they didn't pay the temple tax. I, I never knew why they died, I, but God believes that Israel is His. 
David was acting like he had control over them. It doesn't matter how many soldiers you have. See, David was a, a thinking about war. And he wanted to number his soldiers. And see, the only people that are allowed to be counted are people 20 to 50 that are men that can fight in war. All the rest don't count. <clears throat> so he wanted to do a census because he was thinking about how many people do I have and what size army can I go up against. God didn't tell him any of this. So 70,000 died in a plague. And there it is right there. The Bible is covered. Anywhere you look at it, it's written by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And if you can't figure out why something happens, it's somewhere else in the Bible. He says, don't do this or do that. He's going to tell you, don't do this or you need to do this. And then all of a sudden it comes up. David did it surprised him. David was a man after God's own heart. He didn't think about this. Right. Okay. Now, um, this is what everyone among those who are numbered shall give. A half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 geras. The half shekel be a, shall be an offering to the Lord. Uh, everyone including among those who are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. Okay, a half a shekel at one time was 37 cents. That's how cheap this was. Don't you wish David would have paid it for 70,000 men? Wow. So even a poor person could afford to pay their own redemption. It's redemption money. You remember how I talked about how the, the Egyptians had to die to redeem the Jews. Redemption is different than just saving somebody. You know, I, I use the term, you know, the, the green stamps. If anybody's old enough to remember that. You would take a book of green stamps down and get yourself a toaster. You would redeem a toaster. And so that's what we're talking about here. There's redeeming people. So when a person was redeemed, somebody had to shed blood. Somewhere. Right. Okay. 70,000 were... And silver is counted as blood. Okay, what? So the 70,000 were... Yeah, they died. Yeah. Okay. I just thought that was an interesting way to look at this silver. Was we think of it? I want to keep keep it on Jesus's blood because He redeemed all of us. He redeemed us with His blood. He traded in His green stamps, all of His green stamps for all of His people. So it wasn't just saving us; it was redeeming us. Because what was owed? The wages of sin is death. So somebody had to die. Jesus died. So it's a redemption. You know, we, we keep talking about it as, well, Jesus died for our sin. Well, He died to, for our sin, that's true. But it was to redeem us, to buy us. We have been purchased, just like the toaster. You know, we belong to Him. What we think is, well, I'm still in my flesh, so I, I'm going to do what I want to do. And Jesus said, no, you belong to me. We don't think about that. But we need to think that we belong to him. He purchased us for yes. the price. I think of the song, redeemed by the blood of the Lord. Oh, yeah. Okay, this is a very strange uh, verse about redeeming people with money. The money was to be used for the priests to handle the duties at the tabernacle. It was a small amount of money. Depending on the value placed on silver, it could have been as little as 37 cents. Everyone could afford it. But since God believes He owns all of Israel, it is an important thing to pay them this money any time the people are counted. David listened to Satan to count the troops one time, and God wanted to show him that he belonged, that he, they belonged to God and not to David. 70,000 died of plague because David didn't pay his ransom money. Okay? Leviticus 17, 1, 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. Now, Jesus hadn't died yet. This is in Leviticus. And He says, I have given it on the altar for your souls. Okay? For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. 
See, all the Jews thought about was killing lambs and goats and things like that. But he is saying, I have given it to you. Back in Leviticus, he's promising that he's going to take care of it. The silver in the tabernacle was atonement for Israel until Jesus paid for them with blood. So the silver was just atonement until Jesus paid the price. Okay? 1 Peter 1.18 Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. So he is saying silver and gold is corruptible. Okay? From your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but when the precious blood of Christ as the Lamb without blemish and without spot, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. <clears throat> so He is saying that I redeemed you with my blood. Jesus was foreordained to pay the ransom price in blood instead of paying with silver. We must remember that the redemption involves a trade, and in our case, with blood. This is just a reminder. Silver equals blood, and blood equals redemption. So anytime you see blood, you can think of silver, and anytime you see silver, you can think of blood, and it all redeems. Okay? 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He's just telling you, I own you. Glorify me. We read this and we think it's beautiful poet, poetic language and everything. And you say, no, I own you. Yes. So take your, take your fleshly thoughts under control and start living spiritual thoughts. That's what he's asking for. Okay? We have been bought by Christ and are not our own anymore. We owe him our entire lives. Even Judas, when he realized what he had done, threw the silver down in the temple and the priests could not put the blood money back in the treasury, so they bought the potter's field, and they call it the field of blood even today. Because the field was bought with silver, it's called the field of blood. Okay? Silver and blood are connected all throughout Scripture. So the whole tabernacle of standing on silver just means all of our redemption rests on the blood of the tabernacle, tabernacle Jesus. Jesus is our tabernacle. Okay? 1 Corinthians 3.11 For no other foundation can anyone lay than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, our foundation is Him. The silver foundation that the tabernacle is standing on is Jesus. Okay. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So he is saying, you can build your life with wood, hay, and stubble, or you can build it with gold, silver, and precious stones. But it's all going to be thrown in the fire, and all that's left is all you get. Okay? Uh, if anyone's work which has built on, on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as so through fire. This is what I was talking about before. The acacia wood is, represents humanity covered in gold. So when we're saved, when we become part of the tabernacle family, when we're saved, our wood is covered in gold. The wood may burn, but we will still have treasure in heaven. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? That word temple could be tabernacle just as easily. Okay? Uh, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So we are to remain separated from the world. That's what holiness means. Just separate yourself from the world. Doesn't mean you have to be perfect. He said be perfect for, because I'm therefore perfect, you know. But I'm just saying that he has grace for us, but we are to always be on God's side and never follow the world. When you see new music come up, you think that worldly music is so cool, we are to go to God's side. When we see new movies come up or new video games or whatever, we are to stay on God's side. When the world is sucking you into it with drink and dope and women and whatever else carousing around, we are to stay on God's side. Okay, what? I told her that's that debate. Debate of Satan. Debate of Satan, exactly. I might have to remember that. <laughs> that appears. 
Okay? This is why the blood of Jesus is so important teaching in Scripture. You can't have redemption without blood, and so many want to leave out the blood. It cannot be done. Everything rests on the shed blood of Jesus for our redemption. You're going to find lots of religious people today that don't want to talk about the shed blood of Jesus. Yeah. It's all about the blood of Jesus. I don't see how you can even talk about redemption without the blood of Jesus. Right. So it can't be about Jesus was a nice man and he was a prophet and he healed people. It has to be about the shed blood of Jesus. Without the blood, you're not saved. You right. deny the blood. If you deny the blood, you're not saved. Yeah. So everything rests, stands on the foundation of the blood. Okay? <clears throat> you shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with the artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon the four sockets of silver. So we're back inside the temple, now, our tabernacle now. We're building another... We're building the veil. This is what the veil is. Verse 33. And you shall hang the veil from the clasp. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy place. So he is saying that if you do right, you can get into the holy place, but you can't get into the most holy place. This veil is to be only gone behind by the high priest once a year. That's the Day of Atonement. Now, I never could figure out how thick the veil is. There are lots and lots and lots of estimations. I'm figuring that this one was four inches thick. Just think about a carpet. Four inches thick and how heavy that would be. The one in the temple was 18 inches thick. You couldn't move it. It would be like a brick wall. But the the, to get into the Holy of Holies, they had to, to kill a ram, and the high priest had to go sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat once a year. That's the only time they could Actually, go back there. They could look through it and see it, right? They couldn't look through it. No, not until Jesus died. Until Jesus, okay. Mm -hmm. Just think about this. I, I'll, I'll talk about it later. I'll probably have to repeat myself. <laughs> but when Jesus died on the cross, he gave up his spirit, the veil tore. Just imagine the priest that went into the holy ground. And they could see all the way into the Holy of Holies. Right. They probably backed out of the place. Probably. They probably scared them to death. Yeah. Because they did not want to get that close to God. Instead of realizing that Jesus had paid the price, and now we can go into the Holy of Holies, I'm sure that it scared them to death. Because they had never seen the Ark of the Covenant. Right. This was done once when it was moved back there when they built the temple. You know, They have to dedicate the temple. All kinds of... There's, I think when... Uh, uh, Solomon dedicated the temple. There was like 10,000 oxen was killed. There was blood everywhere to dedicate the temple. Just think about the ark. Uh, I mean the uh, uh, altar that we're going to talk about, the bronze altar, I think it's going to be next week or so. Think about millions of animals that died there. Just think of the blood that was splattered all over the mercy seat. They didn't go in there and polish the gold. It just hardened up and got rotten and everything. You can imagine. Of course, it might have made, remained fresh blood because God was there. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But just think about yeah, all of the oxen, the goats, and the lambs that were strapped down on the altar and slaughtered for the 40 years it was in the wilderness, 400 years in, mm -hmm. in Canaan land, and then they moved it into the, right. the new temple. I mean, millions upon millions of animals shed their blood and were burned. They have to shovel the ashes out and clean it out all the time to, to keep going. So they knew about blood sacrifice. They knew what it took. And I think God was making it known to them that there's going to be a sacrifice that will not cover you, but will take away your skin. Okay, I think that's what... What he was trying to get across to them, they didn't get it. <clears throat> okay, uh, verse 33, uh, okay, verse 34. You shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy. You shall set the table outside the veil, and the lamp stands across from the table on each side of the tabernacle towards the south. You shall put the table on the north side. 
You shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen made by a weaver. So now he's describing what it's supposed to look like, and if you still got my picture from last week, yeah. you'll see that the veil was in front of the Holy of Holies, and then you had the uh, menorah on the left-hand side and the showbread on the right-hand side, and then now they made a, a veil to go in front of the door. This is just like a curtain to go through. Okay, verse 37. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and their hooks shall be of gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. Now this is kind of strange. The hooks are gold, but the sockets are going to be bronze. So this is the opening where you go into the, to the holy ground. Okay? Now we move to the veil. The tabernacle is long gone and the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, so we'll never really know what the thickness of the veil was. But some estimations for the tabernacle was 4 inches and the temple was uh, as thick as 18 inches or 1 cubic, uh, cubit thick. Now if you'll remember, it's 15 foot high. The boards are 15 foot high, so it's going to be 15 foot, 4 inches thick. Just think about how heavy that was to hang it up there on a curtain rod, you know. Okay. The emphasis was on the separation of man to the presence of God. This veil would be of royal colors and have the cherubim all over it. This separation could only be penetrated one day a year and only by the high priest on Yom Kippur or atonement. Everyone wears white in the tabernacle. Whenever you read about white on, on a set time or a day of uh, what do they call them? Uh, Moeds? Appointments. Appointments. That everyone is white. <laughs> so when you read about people wearing white, they're talking about the Day of Atonement. That's what anytime everybody wears white, it's on the Day of Atonement. Okay? Um, it's kind of a secret. You know, when you're reading the Bible and you don't know everybody was in white, he's just saying, well, it was on the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. Okay, whenever we see white in Scripture, we should think Atonement and high priest on judgment day. The most visible thing we see in scripture about the veil is when it was torn. Matthew 27, 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. So when Jesus yielded up his spirit, it jumps over to the veil. Now here he is, they're talking about him on the cross. And he yielded up a spirit. Then they jump into the temple and say the veil was torn from top to bottom. Now, I don't think anything, I don't think a chainsaw could have cut something 18 inches thick from bottom to top. And it, the temple was like 30-something feet tall. It was twice as big as the, as the tabernacle. So somebody would have had to get a ladder and get up there with their chainsaw and go down like this. But God wanted to show that he tore veil from top to bottom. It wasn't done. It wasn't done halfway then they finished it or anything like that. The reason they're saying this is God was finished with this separation. And, and he points right here to, God, to Jesus yielding up a spirit. So it's like he yielded up a spirit and the veil was torn. So a lot of times you can put things together just by reading, you know. But some of these sound kind of random. They're just giving me information from here and here. You remember how we talked about that one verse of putting in the lamb skins dyed red. There was no golden clasp. There was no description of how big they were or nothing like that. He just wanted to say the lamb skins were red. And they covered the goat skins, which is sin. Okay. The moment Jesus yielded up his spirit, the veil was torn from heaven to earth. The separation from God that the Jews had known from their time in the wilderness was now exposed in the temple. The priests, as they entered the temple, could see into the Holy of Holies for the first time in thousands of years without them being high priests or on, a, on atonement, day of atonement. This day changed everything as we know it about access to God. So this, this day should have... I don't know how the Jews didn't think of this but from the from the wilderness time all the way thousands of years to the death of Christ they were separated from God 
And then they walked in there, and now they weren't separated, and there's the Holy of Holies. They could have walked up right to it. But they didn't accept Jesus. I'll bet you they backed out. They probably ran, thinking God was going to strike them with lightning. Well, they would have run because they would have been taken out of because they can't be before. God was showing who, he, who Jesus know. was. I know. Even, yeah. even the Roman soldiers said, this guy must be the Son of God. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So the Romans knew. that you, I can't imagine a Jewish priest wouldn't know after all the training he's had all these years. But he probably ran yeah. because it yeah. wasn't yeah. what he's used to. Yeah. The factoid that we get from the veil being torn from top to bottom just shows that God tore the veil not by anything that man could have done. The sacrifice of Jesus was satisfactory to pay for the schism made since the Garden of Eden and now God can live with man once again. So the time of the Garden of Eden, that's when He put the cherubim out with the flaming swords at, at the front of the garden to keep us out. That's all gone now. What was on the veil? Pictures of the cherubim. So the cherubim are split and we can walk right in. Yeah. Okay. This thing is drawing a picture... That is, I'm getting all goosebumpy thinking about it here. The one, uh, one more to throw in here is that we, uh, what was embroidered on the veil, cherubim were guarding the holy of holies, and now the veil is split, allowing the entrance way around the cherubim to be with God. If the cherubim are removed, can we now access the tree of life in the Garden of Eden? Can we approach the throne of God without being destroyed? Next week we will continue discussing the features of the tabernacle and continue into the courtyard. So we're working our way from the uh, Holy of Holies out into the courtyard. When they start building it, they're going to be from the courtyard working their way in. We'll go a whole lot faster because we would have already covered it by then. But I thought it was kind of neat that the cherubim were guarding the tree of life. Who is the tree of life? Yeah. Jesus. Jesus.